broadcasting, by the way. Huh? I'm broadcasting. Okay. Start in a few minutes. Just like the last one, I'll timestamp when the lecture actually starts in the comments if you're watching this after the fact. Tristan, come here. There he is. <laughs> Can you say hi? Look at the camera. Hi. Say hi. Hi. You want to say anything? What's up? See anybody on? We're going to start shortly. If anybody's watching this, uh, the way I wanted to handle questions today, you know, the whole interactive side of the class, is I wanted to use the Discord chat feature. I actually have it showing here, so if you can ask a question, uh, I'll pop periodically, check the Discord comments, and see if there's any um, questions uh, for the lecture. Um, you can also use the voice. I am I am in the voice channel, so if you guys want to actually, you know, verbally ask questions, you, uh, I would like if you guys did that. Um, but either way, we have the chat here if you don't want to actually talk on the mic or you don't have a mic, whatever. <coughs> so, um, like I said, uh, I'll, I'll get started here in a minute. It's giving people a few, few more minutes to log in. a few other people online not sure if they're for our class or not Let's see all right <clears throat> well it's uh you know about five minutes after right now I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so uh, today, uh, the, the plan for today's lecture was to, I was going to do some practice in Chapter 7, and then we're going to basically work into Chapter 8. So uh, during Chapter 7, we did go over a bunch of different, uh, you know, reaction types, reaction balancing, that kind of thing. I see myself lagging a little bit. Maybe you have seen that too. Um, anyway, let me switch over real quick, and let's take a look. Oops. Oops, sorry. So fiddling around with the controls a little bit. There we go. Oops, wrong. There we go. All right, so uh, last time we did go over all the different reaction types, and then I was going to do some practice, like I said. Um, so what I went ahead and did was pulled up the 
uh, activity that we have available on Canvas. You guys could be printing these out or just writing them on paper, whichever. Uh, this is the stuff that we were going to use for in-class group work. And my cat wants to get into the video. Chloe. Uh, hi, Chloe. You say hi. Hi, Chloe. <laughs> All right, get down, buddy. All right, so uh, I just want to go ahead and get started, and let's go ahead and do some of these practice problems here. So I just want to go ahead and take a look at this here. Uh, let me show you the setup I have here. I did go ahead and pull up the different files that might be useful for this particular section. Um, and when you're doing solubility problems, you probably want to have your uh, solubility chart available, which I pulled up here. Uh, this one's in your textbook. It's also in the PowerPoint we went through last time, uh, the one for Chapter 7. All right, so uh, starting off here, uh, let's go ahead and take a look at potassium iodide. So remember, you, you do still have to be familiar with your uh, compound naming that we did uh, a few chapters ago. So potassium iodide is Ki. And remember, you want to leave yourself a little bit of space for the states that we're going to have to fill in. So uh, Ki plus uh, barium sulfide. Barium is Ba, sulfide is S. Remember, if you forgot your charges, uh, we use the periodic table. Uh, barium is here in the group two column. And remember that everything in this column had a two plus charge uh, commonly, where this one was one plus. And then over on this side, we saw that the halogens were a one minus, and then these were a two minus, then three minus. And then here we have sulfur, sulfide, which is S two minus. So when we're putting our charges together, remember this was a two plus, two minus, you only need one of each, that formula is now done. All right, uh, use the reaction arrow. <clears throat> and since we're gonna have a double displacement here, you wanna go ahead and have them sp swap partners. Because remember when they go into solution, they all kind of break apart and they can run into each other. So we're gonna have barium go to iodide. Now for the formula here, uh, barium is a two plus, iodine, as you can see on the periodic table, is typically a one minus. And I recommend using these charges up here to help you guys keep track. But this is Ba2. And then we have potassium goes to sulfide, K2S for that one. All right, um, it typically works out where um, all the ones on this side uh, should be soluble, but I want to always check that. So uh, potassium is one of the ions that's always soluble. This is AQ. <coughs> and then the sulfides are typically insoluble, but uh, seeing on our chart here in the bottom right corner, uh, sulfides are, are in the insoluble compounds, but they have some exceptions. Uh, barium is one of the exceptions, which means it's aqueous. All right, uh, then we move, keep moving along here. Uh, we see that barium iodide uh, eyes are typically uh, soluble, and this should also be soluble as well, right? Because barium is not one of the exceptions. And I think, I think I'm thinking we're going to have a no reaction situation here uh, in the net ionic. So K2 uh, potassium is typically soluble. AQ like that, and then if you have a situation where everything is aqueous, uh, we just write it as NR because in the net ionic, everything kind of cancels out. So uh, that's pretty much a dead end there, but just for the sake of practice, I, wanna do, I do want to balance, uh, just to make sure that we're getting our balancing practice in. So on this side, we have two potassiums, so we have one, and I think if we put a two over here, I think we're done actually. Yep, so iodine also balanced, we're done with that problem. Um, someone's saying that they're not seeing me. Um, I am seeing me as being live right now on YouTube. Let me uh, refresh my page and see what I see. Yep, I am seeing myself still as live. So I'm not sure why you can't see me. Um, either way, I'm going to continue. I am recording this in the case where this is not actively streaming, then... Actually, any, can anybody in the Discord right now see me? Oh, come on. 
on. I don't think I'm going to need my keyboard for this. Ugh. Okay. All right, we are uh, we are live. Okay. Yeah, time to take a, a second to load. All right, let's go ahead and continue. I want to go into the next one in this problem set here. So the next one here is sodium hydroxide and iron three bromide. You know, just like the last one, we have to remember how to do our names. So let me just slide this up a little. All right, so uh, the next one here is going to be sodium hydroxide. Uh, recall that hydroxide is OH minus. So we have an NaOH. I don't need parentheses here because we have a one plus and a one minus. And considering it has sodium in it, this is going to be soluble. Remember, sodium, all the group ones are soluble typically. And then we have iron three bromide. That is a Fe three plus. So that means we need three bromides. And remember, if you're having trouble, uh, just go ahead and write your charges above here, and we can use that to help with the subscripts. So iron is a 3 plus, and then bromide is a 1 minus. So we need three of these to balance it out. Um, this is also going to be aqueous. I know that because halogens are typically soluble. And then I look to see if there are any exceptions. The exceptions are silver, uh, mercury, and lead. So this is soluble. At this point now, we have to do the partner swap. So hydroxide goes to iron, and then sodium goes to bromide. So Fe. OH, I'm going to need parentheses here because we have a 3 plus and a 1 minus. So it looks like we need uh, three of the hydroxides to balance out. <coughs> we could check solubility now. Um, hydroxides are typically insoluble. Iron is not an exception, so this is solid. All right, and then for the last one here, uh, sodium goes to bromide. Uh, we need one of each. It's a plus one and a minus one. And this is also going to be aqueous like that. Uh, recall from last time, you know, we did go over, you know, breaking apart into their complete ionic equations or total ionic equations, however you want to say it. Um, break apart anything aqueous and leave anything solid uh, together. We don't break those apart. So, um, and it also works out because the way we're doing this, that typically the one that's soluble on the product side, uh, oftentimes that ends up being the spectators. So let's go ahead and take a look. So breaking apart this one, into Na plus and OH. And then this one is going to now be Fe3 plus, and then we have the three of them there, so there's three bromides. So don't forget to pull that in front. I want to show you a common mistake students do. Um, I've seen students do that, uh, pull it out of Br3 and then 3 minus. That is incorrect. Do not do it that way. That is wrong. You need to put the three in the front. Okay, and then underneath it, I'm going to do the product side. So uh, we leave this one alone. So let me actually change the size on this window. There. All right, so we have, oops, FeOH3 solid, and then Oh, we didn't balance it, did we? So uh, we had to check for that first. Oops, kind of forgot to balance first. We're going to have to change things a little bit then. So we need three hydroxides. We need a three over here. And it looks like we have three and three on the bromides. So we can balance that. So we have three and three on sodium and bromide. So we can balance that here. So I just need to add these in. So it looks like we're going to have a three on sodium over here and then three on hydroxide. And then these ones are still okay. All right, finishing this out, we have three Na plus and three Br minus. Anything that is the same on both sides, drop out. So we cancel out the sodium ions and we cancel out the bromide ions. They are the same on both sides. And then you rewrite this, putting cations first. So we're gonna have our Fe3 plus three hydroxides and then that gives us iron three hydroxide like that 
Yeah, and don't uh, don't forget when you're doing the online homework and mastering that you need to put the AQs after these guys also, otherwise it's going to mark you wrong. All right, do you, did you guys have any questions about this one? Uh, those of you that are in here? Remember, you can put your questions into the Discord chat. I, I, I am watching the Discord chat right now. Uh, the standard. So the question was, why are cations first in the net formula? And that's just the convention: is to put the cation first. Uh, similar to how we how we write our formulas, it's the same kind of thing for writing out these equations. Um, I won't mark you wrong for that, but the homework may. So yeah. So just make sure everything's technically correct when you do the online homework. Okay, any other questions? I see someone typing. All oh, right. So uh, let me just scroll down this far. So th uh, this activity I'm looking at, and you, you, you should be seeing it right now in the bottom middle of the screen, is the uh, activity 3.1 that's found in Canvas. So let's go ahead and uh, look at that again, see what the next ones are. Um, I want to go ahead and take a look at nitric acid and sodium carbonate. It's the one on the bottom of the page on that problem there. And we'll go ahead and take a look at that one. Let's bring up the Discord. All right. <clears throat> yep, so just like the other one, you have to know your names to be able to do this worksheet. So uh, nitric acid, uh, remember when we name our acid names, they're named by the anion. And nitric means it came from nitrate, which was NO3 minus. So we have H, uh, H is a plus one. Nitrate is a one minus. So keeping track of my charges here to help with formula writing. Yep, we have our hydrogen of the plus one, nitrates minus one. And these are aqueous. Um, the next one there is sodium carbonate. Uh, carbonate was a CO3 two minus. So let me take a look here. All right, so keeping track of our charges here, we have a one plus and a two minus. So it looks like I need two on the sodiums to balance this out. And then, uh, AQ because uh, sodium ions are typically soluble. All right, uh, now we have them do the partner swap. So we're going to have H go to carbonate and then we're going to have sodium go to nitrate. So here we have, what was it? Uh, H is a plus one, carbonate is a CO3 two minus. Looks like we're going to need two of these guys here, uh, sorry, two of the hydrogens to balance them out. Uh, this is going to be aqueous. We're going to come back to this one here in a second, but I just wanted to finish this out. And then we have sodium and nitrate, one to one. And that one's going to be aqueous. Uh, so we, uh, we definitely, uh, it may appear at first that we have a no reaction, um, but we actually do have something. But before we go over that, I just want to go ahead and balance, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So it looks like here I need to have two sodiums on this side that and then I also need two hydrogens so now I need two hydrogens two nitrates on this side so I can put a two in front of this one okay <clears throat> so uh, it turns out that uh, certain acids and bases uh, will turn into gases at uh, when they're reacted uh, this technically is an acid based reaction so there's our proton donor which is our acid our proton acceptor is our base I believe the one we did last time were hydroxides, um, but here we have some, a, a carbonate. So I'm going to go ahead and switch over to the PowerPoint, and let's take a look at that. Oops, file, file view, there we go, and then uh, PowerPoint, and there we go. <clears throat> All right, uh, in this PowerPoint, there is a slide that shows you all the different compounds that become acids, sorry, gases when a in acid-based reactions. Um, am I in the wrong chapter? <laughs> Give me one second. I'm, in, I'm looking in the chapter seven stuff here. Where is it? Bear with me, please. I didn't have it ready. Um, there we go this slide. <clears throat> All right, so uh, this is slide number 87 in the PowerPoint. It's talk, uh, talking about how uh, different compounds will become gases in acid-based reactions. 
Uh, so you may notice that the second one down is showing carbonate. Uh, we have an H2CO3. Uh, so it turns out when you have carbonate bases, uh, CO3, 2 minus, and as well as bicarbonates, uh, these become H2CO3. And then in, uh, looking at the second uh, set of reactions there, uh, notice how they become CO2 and water. Uh, we have to account for that uh, in our, our reaction. So let me show you how we do that. So back over to the dot cam. Uh, let me take this thing out. There we go. And we can take this out for now too. We don't need it right now. There we go. <coughs> All right, so uh, whenever you see this compound or any of the other ones that are in that table, uh, we need to think that, okay, we have H2CO3AQ. Uh, this is basically equal to water, liquid, plus CO2, gas. So we essentially have to plug this in to this equation. Anytime you have these different gas ones. So uh, let me go ahead and I'm going to break things apart into their aqueous species. But in place of this one, I'm going to write these. If you think about it, these are liquid, gas. We don't actually break these apart. So only the ones that are aqueous do we break apart. So uh, going through the here, we have 2H plus. And then we uh, remember these apply to everything here. So we have two nitrates now. 2NO3 minus. And then if they have a subscript like this, they get pulled in front. So that's 2H plus, sorry, 2NA plus. And then our carbonate, 2 minus, like so. All right, now I'm going to write this instead of that here. So H2O liquid plus CO2 gas. Oh, gas. All right, and then we have the rest here, the aqueous one, 2Na plus and NO3 2 minus. All right, so uh, now we go ahead and uh, you know cancel things out that are the same on both sides. So uh, going just going through them, H plus, uh, this is not on the side, so that stays. Nitrate, nitrate, oop, I got my two there. There should have been a two. Yep, the two applies to both. So those cancel. Uh, sodiums cancel. And then it looks like we just have 2H plus plus carbonate yield CO, H2O and CO2. And then uh, one last thing I, I like to check after I get to the net ionic equation is to make sure that they are all the smallest whole number ratio. And it looks like they're going to be. And there we go. We are now done. And this is an L, by the way, an L. That's how I write my little cursive L for the symbol for liquid. So there we go. And there is, let's go, there's everything. Okay. Are there any questions on this one? Go ahead and put it in the Discord if you have any questions. Yeah, I think the main trick on these ones is to remembering that we have, you know, these ones, you know, do that. Oh, you're right. Good catch. That is CO2. Yeah, CO2. All right. Um, let me go switch, uh, switch back over to the PowerPoint real quick, and then let's we, we can work out another problem where we uh, use this here. So switch over to file, there we go. Yeah, so uh, the summary here is uh, they are sulfides, carbonates, and by extension bicarbonates. And then we also, uh, the, the one of them that is an actual acid is the uh, ammonium ion. So ammonium ions are NH4+, plus, and those can react with bases and make ammonia gas, NH3 gas. So I think I, I want to go ahead and work out uh, maybe like two more problems here, or two or three more problems, then we'll, then we'll move on. And we should, I, I didn't want to start stoichiometry today, so uh, after we do this, we'll do some stoichiometry. All right, so switch back over to presenter camera. All right. And I think I have disability here. There we go. Yeah, I'm not sure it's showing up very well, but I do have the PowerPoint there in the corner for uh, this particular slide. So the next one I want to go ahead and do is acetic acid plus sodium carbonate. 
Um, this is an acid-base problem. Uh, we have to just write out the compounds. Uh, we do have an acid and a base. So uh, recall that uh, acetic means acet uh, sorry, acetic means it came from acetate, and acetate was C2H3O2 minus. So writing this out, uh, hydrogen is H plus. Our acid goes in the front. Like that. And you want to write your acids as aqueous because they are soluble in water. Um, next we have sodium carbonate. Actually, I want, to, I want to do bicarbonate. Let me fix that there. Bicarbonate. And recall that the bicarbonate ion was HCO3 minus. So it, it was basically a carbonate with an extra H plus attached already. That. So plus one, minus one. We have AQ on this. Okay, uh, you then have them do the partner swap like usual. So uh, H goes to HCO3, that is H2CO3. That is one of the compounds that will become a gas. That is our H2O and CO2 that we're going to see. And then let me go ahead and finish the problem here. So we have Na goes to acetate, sodium acetate. I think I was calling this nacho with you guys. <laughs> this spells nacho. Um, this one's aqueous because we have sodium ion. This is going to be soluble. All right, uh, then I want to go ahead and balance it. It looks like everything is one-to-one -one here. We're all good. So acetate, acetate, sodium ion, sodium ion. And then the H plus here became part of this here. So that's what this is. So we're already balanced actually here. So let's go ahead and uh, break it apart. And then we got a sub in for this one. So I like to highlight these ones when I'm working just to make sure that that's not the final form of them when I do the net ionic. So I have H plus acetate plus sodium plus bicarbonate. Okay, and then in place of this one, I'm gonna go ahead and put H2O liquid and CO2 gas. Um, I, I do want to mention here that in the case where you have a coefficient in front of this one, at this point, uh, you put them here. Uh, that's, that's why I was balancing this form first, because I think it's generally easier to balance it in this form. And then uh, in the case where you have a, you know, a two or a three, you know, on this, you just uh, transfer those to each one of these. And then uh, we have the rest here. Uh, we have the sodium, and then we have acetate. And oops, I was dropping subscripts here. Or the states, they're all aqueous. Anything ionic here is aqueous. All right, so uh, go ahead and cancel out the spectators. Remember, the spectators are usually these guys right here, the ones that are soluble on the product side. So we're, we're going to see that again here. So we have sodium, sodium, acetate, acetate. So we have we we have a very similar net ionic as the last problem. So we have H plus and HCO3 minus gives us H2O liquid plus CO2 gas. Um, most of you guys have actually probably already seen this reaction. You know, you, you can probably do it in your kitchen right now if you have the materials. Uh, this is vinegar and baking soda. These are the common names for those compounds. And yeah, if you guys have ever seen the vinegar and baking soda demo, they actually kind of bubble and fizzes. And what you're seeing here is the generation of carbon dioxide. Yeah, whenever you see a chemical reaction and there's bubbling happening, that means some kind of a gas is forming. And in this case, it's carbon dioxide. All right. So uh, I think we're probably good for acid base right now. Uh, we'll definitely come back to this for practice later on. But I, I definitely wanted to get started into the next chapter. Uh, so switch over to this real quick. I had, a, I had a meme for the day, but I wanted to get ready to get started first. Oops, wrong one. Uh-oh. I had a meme. There we go. Where'd it go? Why is it not showing? It's like, oh, well. <laughs> anyway, it was uh, about stoichiometry again. I'm fumbling with the software here. Let's just go ahead and get started into this. 
All right, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint here. We're looking at the next chapter now, uh, chapter 8. And there was a, a one slide in there that I wanted to look at for this. And let me bring this up on. There we go. All right, so uh, we're, we're basically going to be looking at uh, what kind of mass considerations we have in chemical reactions. Essentially, if we start with this much stuff, uh, how much can you get at the end? Or uh, if you made this much, how much did you have to start with? That kind of thing. Um, you guys probably do this a lot of time when, in, in the kitchen when you're trying to figure out you know, how much uh, food you're going to be working with, um, ingredients for making things. And I think this making pancakes example is a great example. I'm actually going to go through the entire chapter just about with this one reaction. or calling it reaction. And we're going to use this to, to basically go over all the different points uh, that we're going to see in this chapter. And then after doing all these different examples, basically covering the whole chapter, we'll start doing like real problems. And you'll see how your approach is identical, uh, whether or not you're making pancakes or if you are doing some crazy chemical reaction. The approach is the same. Uh, so here we have this uh, general reaction here, uh, that one cup of flour uh, and two eggs, a half of a teaspoon of uh, baking powder gives us five pancakes. Uh, you can imagine this is a chemical reaction. And then these uh, numbers in front are the uh, coefficients. Uh, we call them the stoichiometric coefficients, meaning these are their mole ratios. So one mole, one mole of this, two moles of this, half mole of this, gives us five mole product. You can think of it that way. That's how it's going to work in the chemical reactions. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at some questions that may come from this. And let me uh, bring up that slide onto the camera here. Hang on, give me one second. i got to load the file in. I didn't have this ready. Screen capture. Window capture eight. There we go. That's up. So we're going to need that reaction. We're going to reference it a couple times. All right. So uh, suppose you were trying to make pancakes for your family, and uh, you had, you know, a excess of eggs. You had like, you know, like they had like a big flat of eggs, and you had a huge container of the baking powder, um, but you might have been running out of out of flour. So the question now is with five cups of flour how many pancakes can you make can you make all right <clears throat> so if you had five cups of flour you're following you know this recipe down here in the bottom right corner uh, what is the maximum number of pancakes you could possibly make? Uh, do they want to try to answer that question? You can kind of logic your way through this without having to use uh, chemistry. You probably, probably do similar things at home when you're making food for your family. So what do you guys think? If you had five cups of flour, what is the maximum possible number of pancakes I can make if I had excess eggs, excess baking powder? Give it a second, see if anybody wants to answer. Yep, that is exactly correct. Uh, so, yep, a few of you guys are answering 25. That is, that is perfectly correct. And the, the logic you were probably using is that, oh, you have, you know, five times the amount the recipe is asking for. The recipe is making five pancakes, so therefore 25 pancakes total. Uh, that's exactly the, the kind of logic we're using here. Um, there is a way that we can actually write it out, though, and it's going to be basically the dimensional analysis unit conversion stuff that I've been trying to get you guys to learn this semester. All right, so uh, from the rest, or we have our given value, which was this right here. So five cups. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put FL, uh, short for flour, uh, for sake of time here. And then we're going to have a unit conversion. We need to make a relationship between the amount of pancakes and the amount of flour. And we get that from the chemical, the balanced chemical reaction is where we get that from. So we see from the recipe that it is five pancakes. And the recipe is calling for one cup of flour. All right, so uh, this uh, right here, um, we start doing the real problem. This will be what we call the uh, mole ratio. So it's a mole ratio. And where we get that from, it's from the balanced chemical reaction. Let me make this a little bit smaller. 
It's from the balanced chemical reaction. Balanced reaction. All right. So we can clearly see that uh, the same kind of logic uh, kind of just plays out here. Uh, we have five cups of flour, uh, five pancakes, five times five, 25. And then the cups of flour cancel out, just like we saw when we're doing like the inches feet conversions. And same deal here. Uh, that's actually why I was so particular on how you did, did your setups is because I was getting you guys ready for these kind of problems is what I was trying to focus on. All right. So uh, now that we know we can make uh, 25 pancakes, so suppose you're now getting ready to make these pancakes. Another question that can arise is uh, how many eggs did it take to, to make these 25 uh, pancakes? So the next question is how many eggs? So we know we're going to make 25 pancakes. How many eggs do we need? Does anybody want to try to answer that question? How many eggs do we need to make these 25 pancakes? Yep, that's right. Uh, I'm seeing a few people saying it's 10. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, the logic you're probably using here is, or is that you're okay? We're making uh, five times the recipe, so we uh, the recipe is asking for two eggs, so five times two is ten. Uh, we're gonna see that kind of play out in our setup. So um, the the one of the cool things about these uh, stoic geometry problems is that the direction you come at the answer um, doesn't all uh, doesn't really matter as long as you um, are going to the same point and you have a balanced reaction. That's the key part. So I'm actually gonna calculate this answer two different ways. So anyway, the guess here we're coming with is 10. Is it 10? All right, so the two approaches I'm gonna take is one is, all right, we were uh, saying that we had five cups of flour, is what we're working with. And then from the reaction, we can see that for every one cup of flour, it took two eggs. So we have two eggs per one cup of flour. Oops, made my line a little bit long there. And the, uh, then we're going to see that, okay, it's 5 times 2, 10 eggs. Like that. And, excuse me, we can also see that the units cancel out properly, cup to flour cancel, we have eggs left behind, which is what you want. Uh, the other approach we could have taken is uh, we can uh, start from the 25 pancakes. So that was the target is you know, 25 can cakes. And we can make a, we can make a relationship between pan, pancakes and eggs now. So the thing is here, it doesn't matter what side the two things are. As long as your reaction is balanced, you can go to either side. So stay on the same side or go opposite sides. It doesn't matter. So what I'm doing here now is I'm making a relationship between a product now and a reactant. Where these were reactant to reactant. Same answer is going to work out here. So we have two eggs, this is per the recipe, two eggs gives us five pancakes. And then we are going to see here that the units for pancakes cancels. We're getting eggs left behind and then we have 25 divided by 5 which is 5 times 2 is 10. So you're going to see this a lot of time when you're doing your homework that you have multiple ways to approach the same answer. And they're both correct a lot of times. And we're, the same thing here, uh, they're both correct. Okay, so uh, there are like, two more problem types we have to go through here, and then we'll start doing some real problems here. Yeah, so we, I think we're definitely going to have enough time today to get uh, some real practice in with this. All right, so we're, we're following the same pancake recipe here. Um, now we're going to say say that we're, uh, what if we have, like, a, so the Sorry, the last problem we did, we had an excess amount of everything else. And in this case, we're going to have limited amounts of everything. And we, and we have to figure out which one or how many, pan can, how many pancakes can you make from what you have available. So let's just go ahead and say we have, let's say we have 10 cups of flour. Uh, let's say that we have a, I don't know, let's say we have only eight eggs. And let's say that we have, I don't know, let's say that we have 17 
tablespoons of baking powder available. Baking powder. Uh, the question now is, how many pancakes can you make from these recipes here? So, how many pancakes can be made? And I'm going to keep uh, emphasizing here, this is the maximum possible we can make from this calculation. So the maximum. All right. And we're going to see uh, also that you don't always get the maximum. If you guys have done any cooking, you've probably lost a pancake at one point. I know I have. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that after this problem, uh, dealing with loss in our reactions. OK, uh, so what we need to do here is we need to make, make a relationship between each one of these individually to the amount of pancakes. And it's going to work out whichever one makes the least amount that is the actual maximum amount you can make, and whichever one led to that, that's referred to as being the limiting reagent. So let's go ahead and set it up. So we have 10 cups of flour, FL for short, like the last one. And then I'm going to make a relationship to pancakes now. Uh, let's go ahead and call pancakes PC for short, just for the sake of time. You guys know what I'm, we're talking about here. So uh, from the recipe, it says that we have one cup of flour to five pancakes, PC. Okay, so look what do we have here? We have 10 divided by one, 10 uh, times five is 50 pancakes. All right, so uh, next we go ahead and take a look at the eggs. So we have eight eggs. And then we go ahead and say that we have a relationship uh, from the reaction of two eggs per five pancakes. What is that? Uh, eight divided by two, four, four times five, 20. 20 um, pancakes. And then the last one here was... I'm asking questions. I'm just trying to do something productive. Sorry, my wife is working from home also. I think she's taking a call right now. Yeah, we're all working at home now. We got the boy and the wife here today. It's gonna be great. All right, so uh, this part can be a little bit tricky just due to the fractions that happens here. Uh, but from the recipe, we see that it's five okay. pancakes per one half teaspoon of baking powder. So we, we actually have, we have one or five divided by one half. That is five times two, okay. 10. 10 times 17 is 170. Okay, I can do that, no problem. All right, uh, let me uh, change the size of this so we can see the whole thing at once. All right, so based off of this, how many pancakes can, can be made? Okay. So whichever one makes the least. So it's going to work out this one right here is the least out of all of them. So that is actually the maximum amount we can make. This is referred to as the theoretical yield. Um, unfortunately, uh, these numbers here are kind of pointless now because uh, these would be the case if these ones were, li were limiting. But we're finding out here that because this one made the least amount, eggs was the limiting factor. So the eggs is what we call the limiting reagent. That's our theoretical yield. And I'll go ahead and write some definitions here. So theoretical yield is the maximum possible based off what you're starting with. Uh, the limiting reagent is whichever one leads to this. So limiting reagent, it is essentially the factor that limits your yield. So it was, it, it, and it's whichever one leads to the theoretical yield. So it's a limiting factor for yield. And then it produces the least. Produces the least. Okay. Um, all of the other ones are referred to as being the excess reagents. So this one is excess reagent. And then 
your banking powder is also the excess free agent. We have, and what we mean by excess is that you're going to have some left over after you're done. Uh, you're not going to have any of this one over, so you're going to have to go back to the store and buy some more eggs. The grocery store had egg yesterday. I was really happy. They were out last time I went. So, <laughs> all right. Um, are there any questions on this problem? So, anything? Any questions about uh, theoretical yields, uh, limiting reagents, etc.? Okay. Um, another kind of question I could ask here is, uh, how much do you have left over? Uh, of the excess free agents. So after you make your 20 pancakes, uh, how many are left over? So the question I have now is how much of the excess free agents are left over? Okay. So uh, to figure this out, uh, the first thing you need to do is to figure out first how much was actually used. And we can use, uh, going back here, um, we can use either one of these as a starting point. I'm going to do that for one of them, but then I'm just going to go ahead and stick to one of them from then on. But I'm going to show you for the first one that either starting point works here. Uh, the math will work out. So one of our excess free agents was the flour. So uh, we can do two setups here. We should get the same answer, so we don't make any mistakes. So one of the factors was the limiting reagent, the eight eggs. Uh, the other factor we, can, we could have considered is that we made 20 pancakes. So uh, we can use the balanced reaction to make relationships here. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so uh, eight eggs, so the relationship was two eggs per one cup of flour. Remember, we're trying to figure out how much uh, flour was used here. And then the other case here was that it was two eggs per, oops, I messed it, made a mistake. Let's put pancakes there. Sorry about that. Uh, we want pancakes to cancel, so it was five pancakes per one cup of flour. All right, uh, they, they look like they both equal four. Yep, uh, eight divided by two is four. Four cups of flour. Or this way says the same thing. So remember, uh, you may have multiple ways to get there, but as long as your setups are correct, the math works out to be the same. So uh, you're not quite done yet with this problem. Uh, it works out where this is how much was used. So this here is amount used. In order to figure out how much excess is remaining, I like to use this equ equation. So excess, you know the word excess, shorthanded, is equal to the starting amount minus the used amount. So how much you started with minus how much you used, it works out. So going back to the original question, it said that we had 10 cups that we were starting with and we used four cups. So we have six cups left over. All right, so get yeah, six cups left over. Let me change the size of this again. There we go, and there is your whole setup for that one. So when you do the next two, uh, you, you just pick one. So I, I don't recommend doing out both just because it's extra work. If you want extra practice just to prove the point to yourself that it works in these problems, go ahead. But I will never ask you for both setups. I will only one or the other. Just whichever one gets the right answer. <laughs> they both do. All right, so I just want to go ahead and do the next one here. Uh, with uh, We have this here. We still had the baking powder to consider. So uh, I'm just going to go ahead and use the 20 pancakes as my limiting uh, factor here. So we made 20 pancakes. And then the recipe uh, asked for a one half tablespoon of baking powder, and that was for per five pancakes. Okay, so we have what 20 divided by five is four, and then divided by two is two. 
So two tablespoons of baking powder. If you guys have done any uh, cooking at home, this one is usually in far excess because you buy the big container of it and that lasts for like a year. So uh, this makes sense to me. So excess was how much we started with. We started with 17 tablespoons. We used two of them. And that means we have 15 tablespoons left over. Remember, BP stands for baking powder uh, in that equation there. All right. Uh, are there any questions about limiting excess, how much left over, anything? All right. Hope you guys are liking the, the Pikachu back there, <laughs> the blanket covering the window. <laughs> Was letting it too much light. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and uh, wrap up this whole pancake discussion, and then we'll do some real problems, and then I think that'll be class today. So we may run the whole time. We'll see. All right. Uh, so the question I want to go over now is: uh, Suppose you were trying to make these twenty pancakes. You laid out all your ingredients. You started cooking. And then you found that some of them broke, whatever, they got burnt, whatever, some, some way you lost them. And you only ended up bringing 17 of them to the table. So let's say you tried to make 20, oops, tried to make 20 pancakes. Remember that, 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 that number was our theoretical yield from earlier. That was our theoretical. But only made 17 and it's from the same amount of ingredients. From the same amount of ingredients. The question now is what is the percent yield? What is the percent yield? That is our new term that we have for this section here is percent yield. So the way we uh, calculate this is you take uh, what you actually got divided by the theoretical. So you have essentially how much did you actually make divided by how much was possible. So we have percent yield is equal to the actual over theoretical. And that's your ratio there. And then to get it to a percentage, hi Tristan, hi. I see you planking over there. We're talking about percent yield on pancakes. So exciting. <laughs> All right, so uh, our actual in the problem here, you actually made 17. And then the theoretical was 20. The units should cancel here. The, the units would be pancakes. They cancel out. And then times 100%. And then our calculator. I'm going to use my calculator for this. Are you laughing at my son planking over there? <laughs> yeah. So uh, the 85%. All right, so uh, I know we've been going over pancakes here for the last, you know, 30 minutes, but literally the problems are identical. Uh, the only thing different is you have the extra layer of grand mole conversions. Uh, but all the stuff in the middle, the mole conversions, this is it. It's all just making pancakes. So it's, it's not too bad. Uh, just if you ever get lost in the problems, remember how to make pancakes because this is like the simpler type. Uh, the definition of percent yield is how much did you make of the actual possible. So that is percentage, percentage, <clears throat> oh my gosh, hang on, percentage of possible, or you can just say percentage of the theoretical. Remember, your theoretical is the how much is possible. 
<laughs> All right. So uh, let's go ahead and um, I, I, I kind of want to do a real problem now. So um, let me go ahead and take a look at the PowerPoint for this chapter. There are some real problems in here. Interestingly, uh, this particular book jumps right into hard problems, or this, this PowerPoint does anyway. Um, where is it? I wanted to. Hang on. More multiple versions. All right, so uh, yeah, let's go, go ahead and work through a couple of the ones that are in this PowerPoint here. Uh, let me switch over the view. All right. Uh, the answer's kind of, kind of written out there for you, but uh, I, did, I did want to talk about it a little bit, and then we'll, we'll do some problems in the worksheet, I think, instead of the PowerPoint. All right, so uh, the question here is, is asking you, uh, how many moles of NaCl result from the complete reaction of 3.4 moles of Cl2? So we, we have our given a quantity, 3.4 moles of Cl2, and then we need to figure out uh, <coughs> how much of the product we're going to get. So let me just write it out. Yeah, this PowerPoint's kind of dark looking. Presenter camera, there we go. Okay, so uh, on this kind of problem type, you have to have a balanced reaction. So the reaction there was given to us, hang on, hard, hard to see in this. It was two moles of sodium, just writing it out, plus Cl2 yields two moles of NaCl. So yeah, so if you want to read a reaction, you read them with the mole coefficients, because everything in chemistry happens in molar quantities. Oops. Ah, I keep pressing the wrong buttons. Hey, Tristan, you gonna say hi again? Hi. 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 <laughs> Are you gonna help me do this problem, buddy? All right, how do I do it? How do I do it? What do I do next? Talk to the camera. What do we do, what do, we do next? <laughs> Yeah, I'm teaching him chemistry. We haven't got, we haven't got to stoichiometry yet, so he, he, he's not quite there yet. Um, anyway, uh, same problem here. So we basically need to figure out if we have 3.4 moles of Cl2, we can figure out a couple things here. Uh, we can figure out uh, how much sodium is needed. And we can also figure out uh, how much sodium chloride will, will, will we make. All right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and set up. So we have our 3.4 moles of Cl2. Let's just go ahead and figure out how much of the product we can get. So from the balanced equation, we can see that it is two moles of NaCl per one mole of Cl2. So it's just gonna be uh, 3.4 times two. And this is gonna be what, uh, 6.8, two sig figs. And the answer is mole of NaCl. Okay, so uh, you want to be careful here also. So uh, this right here is our ratio. This is what uh, I called this earlier, the mole ratio. Mole ratio. Uh, the other thing people will call this too is the stoichiometric ratio, because this is stoichiometry that we're doing. So it's stoic EO metric ratio. Uh, they mean the same thing. It's just your mole to mole ratio that you got from the balanced reaction. Uh, if you're looking at sig figs here, uh, these are technically counts of objects. These are exact numbers. So I just want to add that little comment here. These are exact numbers. And your sig figs, is just like we saw before, it's typically what you came in with. We came in with that. There's going to be two sig figs in our answer. So two sig figs over here. So it will let you log into Atlas. It will not let you log into So uh, next thing I want to go ahead and do is just do the setup for... Um, Figuring out the other one, so we need to figure out how much of the NaCl, sorry, the sodium was used. So this was pr how much was produced. Yeah. Uh, this is also our theoretical yeah. yield. Same thing. Sorry, I I that. All right. So our, our same starting point. I want to figure out how much sodium. So 3.4 mole of Cl2. Uh, and Tristan, will you please stop doing that? Thank you. 
And it's uh, two moles of sodium yeah, per right one mole of Cl2. Right. Remember, it does not matter what side of the reaction they're on. As long as you're balanced, it all just works out. So what do we have here? Oh, same thing again. 6.8 mole of Na this time. And this is how much was used or consumed. Let's uh, go ahead and use consumed. So you'd have to have at, at least this much uh, sodium to get this reaction to work. All right. Um, I want to go ahead now and uh, do uh, pick out some problems from the worksheets. So we have worksheet activity 3.2 that I'm going to pull up now. So let's switch over to file and hang on. I had it loaded. And maybe you're just seeing it now. Hopefully you're, nope, you're not seeing it yet. Let me, uh, Hang on. There we go. Uh, you should have this worksheet on Canvas. And I just want to go ahead and take a look at something that had some numbers in it. Yeah, let's go ahead and do uh, number 11. Let's take a look at number 11. Let me uh, scroll so it's at the very top. There we go. And we can take a look at number 11. Set your camera, and then this needs to be this, and we don't need that anymore. All right, so uh, this particular question says, let me switch for it's full screen, and then we'll go switch back. All right, so uh, given the following equation, already balanced for you, thankfully, this is one of those combustion problems, butane. Uh, how many moles of CO2 will be produced by the reaction of three moles of butane? So uh, this is a one-step problem. Uh, we need to go from moles of butane, the C4H10, to moles of the CO2. So let's go ahead and see the setup. So we had our 3.0 mole of butane which was C4H10. <laughs> this boy over here, over there. Tristan. He's being a distraction. Down. All right, and then uh, the mole ratio was to CO2. I can't I'm sure I'm seeing this. It looks like it's two to eight is the ratio. So two moles of butane per eight moles of carbon dioxide. So. 8 mole on top to 2 mole of the C4H10. So looks like we have what? 8 divided by 2 is 4. 3 times 4 is 12. Uh, careful on sig figs here. We only have two sig figs. So 12 mole, no decimal place. Mole CO2. Yeah, don't forget about your sig fig rules, guys. Uh, these are exact numbers. Two sig figs, two sig figs, like so. These are exact numbers. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at the next problem there. All right. So it says here uh, how many moles of CO2 will be produced from 32 grams of propane? And we're given a balanced chemical reaction. So let me just go ahead and copy some of this stuff over to uh, this page before I switch the camera view over. 3CO2 plus 4H2O. <clears throat> All right, and we're starting with 32 grams of propane. Right, and switch over to presenter camera. There we go. All right, so there's the problem. And once again, uh, how many moles of CO2 is being produced? Okay, um, just like before, uh, when we're doing our unit conversion, sometimes you have to do more than one step, and it might be useful to make a pathway to go through this. So the path that I'm going to go here, it's going to be grams of the C3H8. Our connective tissue between all of these is mole. So we have to go to mole 
of the C3H8. And then after you have it moles, we can go to anything else. So uh, we're going to choose to go to mole of CO2 here. So the question is actually asking us for mole of CO2, but a lot of questions that we're going to see are going to then go to grams. So it would basically tack another, if it asked for grams, you would have one more step going from grams here. But let's go ahead and uh, take a look how to do this. Uh, if you remember, uh, when we go from grams to moles or moles to grams, you need molecular weight. So uh, we have MW is going to be right here. And I want to go ahead and calculate molecular weight. And let's just take a look how we do this. Just recall, our formula has three carbons. And I'm going to round for the sake of uh, time here, but I would use whatever numbers are on the periodic table. I'm going to round these just for time's sake. And then we have eight hydrogens. So what is that? Eight times one. So we have, what, three times 12, uh, 36, plus eight, 44, I believe. Yep. So three times 12 plus eight is 44. All right. So 44 grams of the C3H8 per one mole. Okay, so uh, that's oftentimes a little side calculation that you have to work on. So uh, let's go ahead and slide up and do our setup. So 32 grams of the C3H8. And then we're going to divide this by 44 grams of C3H8 per one mole. And make sure you, ta you tack on the unit that goes with mole because we're going to be doing mole to mole conversions in this problem. So I need to know mole to what uh, in this part right here. So make sure you put that in there too. Uh, from the balanced reaction, we're seeing that it is three moles of CO2 per one mole of propane. C3H8. Our setup is now done. So we have 32 divide 44 times 3. And I'm getting 2.1818 repeating. And to three sig figs, I should have 2.18 mole. 2.18 mole of CO2. All right. So uh, there's our basic setup for stoichiometry. Remember, this: if you making pancakes or burning propane, the setup is identical. Uh, the main difference here is that we're going to have extra little steps here from random mole uh, conversions. <laughs> Hi, Tristan. Come here. Do the robot. No, 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 no dances. They can't see that. <laughs> hey, let me wrap this up, buddy. Okay, we're we're going to do one more problem, I think, and then we're going to call it a day. So uh, let me go ahead and pull up the worksheet again. Let's do one more problem, and I think that'll be uh, today's lecture. Um, I do want to mention while we're looking through this that um, I'm going to hang out in Discord for a little bit after, this, after I end the stream uh, if you guys want to ask any questions before uh, we wrap up the class fully today. All right, so I think I want to work on, um, let's do number 14. Don't, no, please don't do that. I want to go ahead and work on number 14. So let me switch back over. I'm going to write down the pertinent information. I need the balanced reaction. So that is 8Fe plus sulfur S8. Um, I like to always check if it's actually balanced. Sometimes there's little mistakes in here. Then you get like you can't get the answer because you, you have the wrong balance equation. And then it's saying there that we're, uh, so what mass of iron is needed to react with 16 grams of sulfur? So 16.0 grams of S8, and we're trying to figure out how many grams of iron. Tristan, please stop. Tris, come over here and talk to Daddy's trying to live stream this Yeah, he wants to live stream too. Thank goodness Mommy's home right now. <laughs> She's helping out. All right. Um, all right. So here was what I wrote down. So the question is asking us how many grams of sulfur to how uh, takes how many grams of iron. Remember, it does not matter what side they're on. These are happen to be on the same side, but we could go across two. So starting out, we need the molecular weight for S eight. 
So sulfur, I believe, is about 32. I'm getting, see it really well, 32.065. I'm gonna go ahead and use that. So, oop, 32.065. There's eight of them times eight. That is my molecular weight that I'm gonna use, uh, 256.52. All right, so 16.0 grams of S8. I think we're going to need three steps here. We're going to go from grams to mole, mole to mole, and then mole to gram. All right, so setting up here, we had 256.52 grams of S8 per one mole. Don't forget to tack on the S8 there. We need that. We then use the reaction to get a mole ratio. It is eight moles of iron per one mole of S8. And then the last step we need here is we need the atomic weight of iron. I think it's 55 something. It's in the middle, 55.845. So 55.845 grams of Fe on top per one mole of Fe. You can always check units too. Grams of S8 cancel, moles of S8 cancel, moles of iron cancel, we have grams of iron left over. That's what we want. All right, we're fully set up. Now we use the calculator. So we have 16 divided by 256.52 times 8, and then times 55.845. All right, so final answer is 27.865, blah, 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 three sig figs. We start with three, end with three. So we're going to have 27.9. Please stop, Tristan. Do you want to get trouble on a live stream? You're about ready to happen. You promised me you would behave. You're not behaving. Okay, so 27.9 grams of iron, assuming we started with that amount. Uh, it's going to re be required to make the iron S. Uh, the last thing I want to go ahead and do here is I just want to go ahead and figure out uh, from either one of these how much of the product we're going to get. And I think we'll end the class with that particular uh, problem. So question now is how much, so how many grams of the iron sulfide are we going to get at the end. So uh, just like before, we can start from this number or from this number. So I'm going to go ahead and start from 16 grams. All right. Uh, All right, so uh, I now need to go to moles of the product here. So it is eight moles of FES, and I believe it was one mole yeah. of the S8. And then we need to do an, another side calculation. We need the molecular weight for the iron sulfide to get grams. So I'm going to go ahead and take my periodic table here. It was 55.845 for iron plus sulfide, which was 32.065, and that molecular weight is the 87.91. So here, 87.91 grams per one mole. Like that. Um, I, just want, I want to go ahead and do both setups here, uh, just for the sake of complete, and we should get the same answer for both, assuming we made no mistakes. I'm hoping I didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> so uh, 27.9 grams of iron. We're going to have to get the moles. Uh, we had the molecular atomic weight earlier. So we have our 55.845 grams of iron per one mole. We then have our mole ratio. And from the reaction here, it was 8 moles of iron to 8 moles of iron iron 2 sulfide. It does iron 2 sulfide, practicing naming. 
and then our molecular weight that we just calculated earlier. So notice how the n is going to be identical here. So we're going to grams. So 87.91 grams of FES per one mole of FES. All right. So 16, let me oops, put this up here. So 16 divide 256.52 times 8 times 87.91. And I am getting 43.9. So 43.9 grams of FES or let's try it the other way. We should get the exact same number back. So 27.9 divide 55.845. And then we have 8 divided by 8, that's 1. So uh, next part times 87.91. And notice how they're slightly different. That's probably a rounding issue, but they are about the same. So that's 43.9 also to 3 sig figs. And my guess, the reason why they're slightly different is the rounding in this number. So we rounded this number earlier here. If we use the full number the calculator gave me, these would probably be exactly the same. So a little bit of rounding difference, but they're still within the ballpark. And even rounding the 3-6 figs, they end up being numerically the same. So there we go. Uh, one last little thing before I end in the class today is uh, we can do another example here if... Uh, what if the person made only 21 grams? What is the percent yield? So, what if 21.0 grams of FES was actually made? Question now is calculate percent yield. Remember, uh, the percent yield was actual over theoretical. So we have our 21.0 grams of our actual in the problem. You're going to be told that number because we don't expect you guys to actually run the reaction at home. <laughs> so you're going to be you're going to be told that number. You typically will calculate theoretical yield. Our theoretical yield we saw from here is these numbers here. So the 43.9. Grams. Grams cancels. Don't forget, you need to multiply by 100%. So grams cancel out. This is supposed to be a 4. Let me fix my 4 there. All right, so final answer, 21 divided by 43.9, and then times 100, and then I'm getting 47.8%. Okay, Oops, it's supposed to be a seven there. Sorry about that. Seven. All right, so uh, I believe we are actually just about out of time. If we were in lecture, I'd be letting you go three minutes early right now. And I'm going to leave the stream open for another minute or so, see if you guys have any last minute questions that you want to ask before I end this. And then, yep, yeah, we'll be done. So um, while I'm sitting here waiting, um, I'm recommending, you know, you, you know, it is crazy out there right now. Please stay home. I'm hoping your, all your shopping is done now. Um, I did do a, lot, a little bit last minute shopping myself, but I went like way early in the morning when nobody was there. There were like two people at Albertsons when I went there. I went there at 6 a.m. yesterday on a Sunday. So they were kind of dead, but there were still more people there. Um, be safe. Make sure you're sanitizing, washing your hands. Uh, so the question was, uh, for the grams of iron, uh, why is it set 8 moles of iron to 1 mole of S8? Uh, that is the ratio from the balance reaction. So we have the balance reaction here. Uh, the ratio is, is uh, 8 to 1. Okay, 8 moles of iron to 1 mole sulfur, or 8 moles product to 1 mole sulfur is how we're doing this. And uh, yes, this is going to be an every Monday, Wednesday thing. I'm planning on doing it, uh, pretending like I'm going to class every day. So uh, I think I mentioned before, but I'm, I'm trying to do my routine here. So I, I get, I'm getting dressed for work, you know. I get dressed for work, and then I'm going to be presenting lecture content on live stream when class would occur. So remember, class was Monday, Wednesday, 9.30, 10.50. That's my streaming time. Um, outside that window is just going to be Canvas and that kind of stuff, you know, online communication. I won't be live only during lecture time. 
Uh, I will also be live in, in Discord during office hours. So I won't be streaming in though. I'll, I'll just be on the mic in Discord. So all right, I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. Um, I'm going to go ahead and stay in Discord for a bit. So if you want to not be shy anymore and, and actually ask me voice questions, please feel free to do so. I will be around for another hour or so in Discord. Uh, we were in chapter eight. So uh, we did end of seven, eight. Uh, there was a typo on Canvas for the PowerPoint titles. I fixed it this morning. So we are doing chapter seven and eight right now. Uh, the st so seven was the, all the different reactions and balancing. Eight is, is stoichiometry. And the exam is going to be chapter seven and eight. Only two chapters this exam because this is kind of a dense topic. So I want to make sure you guys are getting, doing a good job today. All right. So with that note, I'm ending the stream.